Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to share with you a worked example regarding performance modeling. Performance modeling anchors instruction and performance improvement efforts back to the authentic performance competence requirements back on the job for your learners. It's all about data integrity, and by that I mean the accuracy of the data, the completeness of the data, and the appropriateness of the data. I will present to you in this little session the questions that I use to generate the data, to elicit the information from a team of master performers and other subject matter experts, plus perhaps supervisors of the target audience and some novice performers from the target audience who have recently climbed the learning curve. Now, I prefer to use this facilitated group process, and I've been doing so since 1979, but it's not always feasible. The data can be generated via traditional interviews, observations, and document reviews. It's just that that takes a lot longer. So we start with generating what I call the areas of performance before we dive in deep and gather specific details. And by specific details, I mean the key outputs that are produced, the measures that reflect the stakeholder requirements, the key tasks that are performed to produce that output, and then the various roles and responsibilities. That part of the model I call ideal performance. It's not blue sky idealism. It reflects the experiences and the levels of performance of the master performers. Now it can also be used to project future performance that's beyond what's currently being produced. That's a little bit more tricky, but it can be done. And I've done this on projects with clients who were interested in not solving a problem, not addressing a greenfield operation, but in more of an appreciative inquiry approach to all of this, where they wanted to take current performance and simply boost it. Now on the right hand side of the performance model you'll see typical performance gaps, probable gap causes, and then some coding that reflects what are the types of the probable gap causes. And why do I use probable gap cause instead of root gap cause? Well it's because in the group process that I use I simply don't have time to ask why and so what five times or more to generate the real root cause. My goal is typically to go after this from an instructional design standpoint and therefore what I'm really trying to identify while I'm doing this is what are some of the barriers to performance that master performers most likely have figured out and know how to avoid in the first place and how to recover if necessary in the second place. The questions that I use dive into the specifics of what are those areas of performance, which are also known in the real world as major duties, key results areas, accomplishments, etc. There's many different names for this, so don't let that throw you, but this is just my term because I found in the past, way back in the 1980s, that some of the other labels carried nuanced meanings to the people in the room, and that was getting them my way of generating the kind of data that I needed for my downstream needs. Once we've established these areas of performance, we want to understand what are the outputs produced. Next, we want to understand how do you tell a good one from a bad one? What are those measures that reflect stakeholder requirements? Are there specific standards per measure? And then we get to the task analysis. So what tasks are associated with each one of these outputs? And then I'd like to understand what are the various roles involved in the process and what are their responsibilities? And there's a couple of ways to get to this and we'll look at that. But it's important that role clarity is established for people being trained, people going through learning experiences to better understand and develop their own performance competence. So it's really critical to understand, well, who does what? 
Then we can move into the gap analysis against that ideal that we've already captured. So given the measures and standards, where do other performers, non-master performers, fall short in meeting those expectations? And we can capture those, and then we can determine what are the probable gap causes. Now this is off the tops of the heads of the master performers, the other subject matter experts, perhaps supervisors and novice performers. So we take it with a grain of salt. Uh, we just want to capture that because this is what they think. It doesn't make them right, and just because you can get a group of people to concede to something, you've generated a consensus, doesn't mean they're right. But as I've always said, who else would you ask? You can determine the real root causes later if that's necessary. But the goal here is to understand what gets in the way of performance. And besides teaching the learners how to perform, we need to also help them anticipate problems and barriers in their workflows and avoid them. What are the strategies and tactics of the master performers to avoid these kinds of barriers? And if they were unavoidable, what do you do next? So this is the data set and the series of questions uh, that I use to generate performance modeling data. So the areas of performance are captured on one particular chart, if you will, a page, a flip chart page, or an online screen if you're doing this virtually. And then you can identify what are the outputs produced, what are the measures per output, what are the standards per measure. My experience suggests that most measures that master performers can identify don't have particular standards. They vary tremendously. So that's a little bit more difficult and I don't often capture standards. Next, what tasks are performed per output? I like to call those two data sets the output task cluster. It's the output measures and the tasks all together as one cohesive unit. When I'm thinking about doing instruction on whole tasks, that's what I mean. It's really per output. It's incomplete if I don't cover how to generate an output. If I cover a topic or behavior and a task or two or several, but I don't get to how to produce that output to meet the stakeholder requirements, I've done partial instruction, partial task training. Also, again, is the, are the roles and responsibilities, and I use a code to generate those if, if I don't simply use X's. So I might just simply use an X if it's simple, if there's not a lot of different performers involved in the overall performance. But if it's more detailed and more complex, I want to understand, well, who executes the task? Who gives input to the task execution? Who supports task execution? Who does a review and gives feedback? And who is the ultimate authority? They can approve or reject the output or the task performance and make you do it all over again. Again, we want to then compare the ideal performance of master performers. Again, typically, it's not blue sky. It's been done. It's what master performers do. And they can help you identify, well, where are the other non-master performers struggling their performance. And you'll generate typical performance gaps against each measure. So you look at each measure and you generate, well, if they're not accurate, is that true or not? Is it complete? Et cetera, et cetera. Next, we can begin to identify, well, what are the probable gap causes? Now, this is a little tricky. This is where master performers might say, well, I think it's such and such, or it's a particular reason. And you might even get the room full of master performers and other subject matter experts to agree. Again, it doesn't make them right, but that's where you're starting from. And then you want to help the group begin to understand, begin to see that not all gaps are due to a knowledge and skill deficiency. So I'm being a little bit tricky here. It's kind of a Socratic process where I'm taking the group down the primrose path to help them begin to see that sometimes problems in the workflow are not attributable all the time 
to a knowledge and skill deficit. Sometimes it's the process itself, sometimes it's environmental supports, sometimes it's some other individual attribute or value and not necessarily the knowledge and skills. What I'm trying to do here is to begin to shape the understanding of my analysis team and get them on the same page with me in that we don't want to generate knowledge and skill kinds of information for awareness creating or education for uh, knowledge creation or training for skill creation if that's got nothing to do with the performance problems roots. And so I'm really trying to get them to understand that we can develop training for new hires in the future, but if we're here to try to solve a performance problem, perhaps instruction, training, or learning experiences aren't going to suffice. So here's my example. This is actually data that was generated back in the mid-1980s, as I've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, and this was about a sales rep. Now, I've changed some of the language and wording and that, so don't please don't get hung up in all of that. But uh, I'll demonstrate to you how I might go about doing this. So we start with what are the areas of performance? What are the major segments or chunks of the job? And we start with a blank page. Usually I'm doing this in front of a group using flip chart paper, and so I'll ask them a question, are, well, what's one major area of, of the job? What's one major chunk of the job? Uh, what do you do most often? And they might say, well, we're salespeople, so we conduct uh, customer calls. Okay, so I write that somewhere in the middle of the page, not knowing whether this is at the beginning of a process flow, a workflow, or a work stream flow, or not. And once I get consensus, I look around the room and I look for heads nodding up and down versus uh, side to side that, yeah, this is a major part of the job. And, and I tell the group, OK, we'll get into uh, looking at the details for this particular chunk of the job a little bit later. But right now we want to just kind of frame the job in terms of major chunks like these. So what do you do before you do customer call conduct? And they might say, well, we do planning and preparation. Okay, I capture that, look around the room. I call that face polling, and I tell the group, hey, I'm doing face polling. I'm looking into your eyes. I'm looking into your nonverbal behaviors to see if you agree with this, because I don't want to move on unless we basically agree that, yeah, that's another major part of the job. And if they all agree, then I say, well, what do you do before this? And they tell me. And I ask, well, what do you do before that? And they tell me. And I ask, what do they do before that? And they say, well, that's pretty much the beginning of the whole cycle, the whole process, if you will. So, okay, and then I go back to the very first area of performance that we generated, customer call conduct, and I ask, what do you do after that? Well, we do sales follow-up because we've made a sales call, and now we perhaps have to follow up, get additional information, get it to the, to the prospect, to the customer. Uh, maybe we have to do paperwork, et cetera. I say, well, what do you do after sales follow-up? They say, well, there's a whole bunch of uh, reports. There's the, uh, the monthly report and the weekly report and the daily report and the hourly report and the minute-by-minute -minute report. Some of them may joke. Um, but anyway, so there's a whole portion of the job that has to do with doing all sorts of different reports and administration-type work. Perhaps this includes following up, making sure that the customer order from two weeks ago has been delivered and everybody's happy, et cetera, et cetera. And then what happened in this particular group is they said, well, we're responsible for our own personal development. We have to do things like keep abreast of the competition, what's going on in the marketplace, what's the general economy in our territories, et cetera, et cetera. So then you ask, so what else is there that you do? And they say, well, nothing. And I challenge them and I say, so in the past two years, there's not one single thing that you've done as a part of your job that doesn't fit within this framework. And if that's true, then you're done with generating the areas of performance and you can go on into then detailing them. So when I go to do the detailing on what I call a performance model chart, I always start at the very beginning of the cycle. This is kind of a cycle. There's territory planning, which comes before account planning. 
and account planning leads to planning and preparation for particular customer calls. Now there may be short cycles where you make one call and you make a sale, or there could be a series of calls, or you might be making calls for two or three years before you make a huge, major, multi-million dollar sale, etc. But so another cycle begins here. I plan and prep for a call, I make the call, and then I do follow-up. And I may do those three areas of performance over and over again until I actually make the sale. Now, the reports and administration and the personal development, those happen on different performance cycles, if you will. This is the kind of insight I'm trying to gather as I meet with a group of master performers, subject matter experts, supervisors of the target audience, and novice performers from the target audience who have recently climbed that learning curve. So now let's look at some of the details that we generate. So for territory planning, just like with the areas of performance, we start off with a blank chart. I go to the chart and I draw all these lines and write all the headers in for the various columns, etc. And I may turn to the group and kind of explain the data that we're going to gather before I start to gather it. Um, but then I start with the first area of performance, which was territory planning. And I ask, so what do you produce? And this is sometimes tricky. I'm going to show you a simple example here, but sometimes there are several outputs. There's a final output, which might be called a territory plan, but there might be interim outputs as well. Um, and I'm, this example here is just going to kind of go to the territory plan. Now, the data that was generated back in, I think it was 1986, uh, on territory planning included several outputs, but I've again simplified this and changed some of the language and wording in this. So the territory plan is the output. Well, then I ask, you know, so how can you tell a good one from a bad one? What are the key measures? Who are the various stakeholders and what do they expect? And we generate a list of the measures of performance. And once you've exhausted that, because there aren't any more measures, Guy, please move on, uh, is sometimes the, the feedback that I might get from a group. Um, then it's time to move over to the tasks. So now that we've firmly identified, here's an output, this is how you measure it. And articulating that, thinking through all of that, should help the team that I've assembled identify the key tasks. Again, this is simplified, but here are some of the tasks that are performed. We generate one after another until basically we have it all done. And once the group says, yeah, yeah those are the major tasks, the key tasks, they're done. They're not micro tasks. We're not talking about setting, resetting the margins on a Word document so that we can produce a report, blah, blah, blah. We are looking at fairly high level tasks, what I might call macro tasks versus mid-level tasks versus micro tasks. In my approach to instructional design and development, I get micro tasks in my development phase and not in my analysis phase or worry about it in my design phase because that leads to analysis paralysis. That's just never ending. And my client hasn't looked at the data to decide what are we going to really address, all of it or just some of it. And if I spend all that time gathering all that micro task analysis data, I might have done that for naught. It might be thrown away or set aside as we focus on certain aspects of the job and not everything. There's some things that should be left to informal learning uh, via trial and error type of learning or social learning, ask your neighbor, or other modes and media that can be used other than instruction. There might be standard operating procedures as one example. So then we want to identify, well, what are the various roles and responsibilities? And our first column there is sales reps, and they do all of this. And is anybody else involved? Oh, yeah, the sales manager gets involved in that last task, as you can see. And so they have a role to play. The next question then is, so what are the typical performance gaps given that output and those particular measures? And I walk over there and I point to that column and I read those things off in case people can't really see them. And we generate what's typical, not atypical, not once in a blue moon, not once every 40 years, but things that are prevalent in terms of performance gaps. 
And again, I'm talking to a group of master performers and other subject matter experts, and I'm asking them about the performance struggles of non-master performers. What do they know about it? What do they think? And they'll tell me. And so I can capture the typical performance gaps, and then I can go back to each one then and say, so what do you think is the cause of that gap? And they'll tell me. And they might say things like, well, they don't know how to do that. You know, it takes a while to learn how to do that. We don't have anything formal in place or whatever. And so that just takes a while through trial and error or social learning to figure that out. Um, but there could be other causes. And I'm really trying to get off the top of their head, what do they think are the prevalent, probable gap causes at this point? And so we focus on one typical performance gap and gather the causes for that before we move on to the next performance gap. And we're slowing down and going fairly systematically about all of this. After that's all done, and they say, yeah, that pretty much nails it, we're done, we've, we've got all that, I want to go back now and, and, and talk to them a little bit about, well, what kind of gap is this? What is that cause? Is that a deficiency of the process? Is that reflected deficiency of some environmental support? And I may then spend a little time talking about, well, what are the various environmental supports necessary? Or is this a deficiency of the individual's knowledge and skills? They simply don't know. Or is it some other individual attribute and value? And again, I'd spend a little bit of time talking with people about, well, what are those individual attributes and values? So that I can see what this group thinks about that. And then for each probable gap cause, we attribute it to one of the various deficiency types. Now, again, I've been doing this for a long time. I learned what was called a derivative of a derivative of a Gary Rumler approach to performance analysis back in August of 1979. And I used that methodology at Wix Lumber, my first job out of college. And then I moved to Motorola, where I used it for a year and a half there. And then I joined a small consulting firm. And in 1983, my business partners and I wrote an article that got published in the NSPI Performance and Instruction Journal way back in 1984. It took about 11 to 13 months for them to actually publish the article we had submitted. And this article was on using group processes to create models and matrices. An article that we had published after that was submitted to Training Magazine. We wanted this article to come out second, but it actually came out first because of publishing cycles way back in the day. Um, so this one also talked about using a group process on how to build a training structure that won't keep burning down. And this was really all about curriculum architecture or curriculum architecture design, or what today I might call instructional architecture. But it's taking a look at what is the instructional system that needs to be put in place in order to help people develop their own performance competence, given their particular job responsibilities. Just because people have the same job title doesn't mean that they're all responsible for the same things. And to account for all their individual prior knowledge uh, from education and experiences. So there's things that people should be able to perhaps skip because it's not part of their job or they already know it, thank you very much. Um, and so these two articles addressed using the group process. The first one was for analysis. This one is for design. Now more recently, I published these five books in starting in 2020 and through this year, 2022. And these all address performance model because it is central to all of my instructional design and development methods. It is one part of my approach to instructional analysis. And in this year here, I've already published uh, seven mini books and two of them address instructional analysis and then in particular, the facilitated group process. Again, I've been using a facilitated group process for instructional project planning and management, analysis, design, development, and pilot testing 
since 1979. I hope this worked example of performance modeling has been helpful. Cheers.